When I say iconic pitching performance, what comes to mind? For me, the two that stick out are Don Larson's World Series perfect game and Jack Morris's 10 inning shutout in Game 7 of the 1991 World Series. But independent of the stakes or the context of the game, what is the most impressive game ever pitched? Is it Kerry Wood's 20 strikeout game? Max Scherzer's 2015 no-hitter? It's hard to argue against Doc Ellis's no-hitter on acid. Personally though, I'd posit September 17th, 1996, the night Hideo Nomo threw the only no-hitter in Coors Field history. It may not be the most dominant game ever pitched, but when you consider all the factors working against Nomo, I'd say it's certainly the most remarkable. As the 96 season wound to a close, LA took the trip to Denver to play a crucial series against the Rockies. On Tuesday the 17th, after winning the first game of the series, the Dodgers were clinging to a one-game lead in the NL West over the Padres with just two weeks left in the season. The Rockies were still in the mix, but barring a major collapse from another team, they basically had no chance to make the playoffs. The game was scheduled to start at 7 local time, but rain was in the forecast and Hideo Nomo didn't step on the mound until about 9.15. Nomo didn't like pitching in Coors, though to be fair, almost nobody did, especially in recent seasons. This brings us to the first factor that makes Nomo's no-no supremely impressive. Pitching in 1996 was tough in any ballpark. It was the height of the steroid era, and Mark McGuire and others were leading the home run revolution. That season's league-wide ERA was 4.57, the highest for any season since 1930 and the third highest in the live ball era. Teams averaged 1.09 homers per game, the highest of all time to that point, and maybe most importantly to our story, teams averaged 9.33 hits per game, also the highest of all time to that point, and the second highest of any season since integration. Baseball's ever-developing pendulum between offense and defense hadn't just swung towards the hitters, the hitters had grabbed hold of it and they weren't letting go. The pitchers did try to fight back, but they couldn't nibble the corners and hope to get batters to chase anymore. Hitters were too good and lineups were too deep. Their only real line of defense against this new breed of power hitters was to strike them out, and strike them out they did in 1996 with a league-wide 6.5 Ks per 9. This may look pedestrian nowadays, but once again this figure was the highest in baseball history at that point, and few pitchers embodied this shift in pitching philosophy like Hideo Nomo. Nomo had come over from Japan due to a loophole in his contract after 1994, finding success in both Japan and America with his signature deceptive tornado windup and a biting forkball. Nomo became the second Japanese-born player to play in the majors and the first in 30 years when he made his major league debut in 1995. And he was a sensation, winning the Rookie of the Year while baffling hitters with his unorthodox delivery and pitch mix and his strong fastball. In fact, of all the possible circumstances you can think of on that fateful Tuesday night, the only one working in Nomo's favor was, well, himself. Nomo was electric in his rookie season, where he led the league in both Ks per 9 and hits per 9, with 11.1 .1 and 5.8 respectively. In retrospect, he was the best pitcher in baseball that year whose name wasn't Maddox or Johnson. In 1996, he was quite good, if not as otherworldly, with a 9.2k per 9 and 7.1 hits per 9, both much better than league average. Nomo's only real weakness was walking a few more batters than you'd like. This came up in the first inning in Colorado when Nomo gave up a free pass to Quinton McCracken after retiring Rockies leadoff hitter Eric Young on a fly ball to center. A smart aleck fan in the sellout crowd may have mentioned that the perfect game was over. Ellis Burks stepped to the plate, which brings us to the number 2 factor working against Nomo. That Rockies lineup was really good, and they were even better at home. In 1996, the Rockies had built a team to their ballpark, which meant a lot of power and a lot of speed. Now, when you park adjust their numbers, the team actually isn't that impressive, but park adjustments don't matter when you're talking about throwing one no-hitter. In the same vein, even though batting average is long outdated, it's actually the most important factor when trying to not get no-hit, so let's look at some batting averages. Here is the Rockies' starting lineup on September 17th. Wow, 285 average for an entire lineup is pretty good, right? Oh, oh, not scary enough? Well, here's their averages at home. The Rockies starting lineup that day had an absolutely off the charts 354 combined batting average at home in 1996. I'm not even sure I can put that into perspective, but I'm gonna try. The last player to hit for an average that high in a full season was Josh Hamilton in 2010. You ever hear of a guy named Ted Williams, the greatest hitter who ever lived? In this convoluted scenario I made up, Nomo had better odds no-hitting a team of 9 Ted Williams than he did no-hitting the 1996 Colorado Rockies. From a purely probabilistic standpoint, the odds of Nomo not giving up a single hit in any of the Rockies' 31 plate appearances that day is 0.00000131, or in other words, 1 in 763,470. 
By my napkin math, there have been about 220,000 total games in Major League history, or about 440,000 games pitched. Nomo's performance was truly one of a kind. Let's move back to the game. Quinton McCracken steals second. There's just one out in the first inning and Nomo's already in trouble. It's still drizzling and it looks like he could be having issues with a wet ball, which is a factor I won't even try to quantify but probably didn't make things easier. Reigning player of the week Ellis Burks with a 6-4-3 average in his last six games steps in. He hits the ball hard in the air to right field. Raul Mondesi jogs back and catches it at the track where by my estimate it went about 340 feet. The ball would have been a home run, or at least off the wall, in about a third of the parks in baseball. Disaster averted. McCracken tags to third easily, but Nomo strikes out the next batter Dante Bichette on a nasty splitter to end the inning. He's out of the jam, but he's given up two hard hit balls and a walk. The Dodgers scored two in the top of the second, led by Raul Mondesi's double, which, well, it's a pretty cheap hit. This ball probably would have been caught at basically every other field in baseball, so let's take this opportunity to look at the third and most daunting factor that made the no-hitter so remarkable. Coors Field. The Coors effect is still alive and well today, so what does it entail? Put simply, because of the altitude the stadium is at, there's less air pressure and thus less air resistance on batted balls, so they tend to fly further. It also means pitched balls' spin rates is converted into less movement, which is also known as spin efficiency, so breaking balls have less break at Coors. That's not all, though. When designing Coors fields, the architects knew this, so to compensate they made the fences further back than the average ballpark. This sounds like it would diminish offense because of less home runs, but it actually means that Coors has the second highest outfield area among all MLB parks. This means way more balls that would normally get caught land in front of outfielders, and it's harder to cover line drives so more balls go to the gaps. All these factors combine to make Coors Field the most hitter-friendly park in Major League Baseball. If you need evidence, teams had a 7.06 combined ERA at Coors in 1996, the highest single-season ERA for a park in Major League history. By baseball reference park factor, where 100 is average and higher is more offense-heavy, 1996 Coors Field had a factor of 129, the highest for any field ever. That year's 1900 hits at Coors were the most in baseball, 10% higher than any other ballpark. Colorado at home had the most runs, singles, doubles, triples, home runs, on-base percentage, slugging percentage, stolen bases, and BABIP of any team in the league. Remember how the Rockies lineup had ridiculous batting averages? Let's look at leadoff hitter Eric Young. When you park adjust his numbers with OPS+, Eric Young was a below average hitter with a 324 average and 814 OPS because Coors in 1996 inflated offensive numbers higher than any field in history. Want more proof? In 1996, Nomo's no-hitter was the only no-hitter in the history of Coors Field. Not only was it the only complete game shutout by any visiting starter at Coors that season, it was the only complete game by any visiting starter at Coors that season. Coors hasn't been quite as bad since a humidor was installed in 2002, which slightly deadened the baseball, but pre-humidor there was nowhere in the majors pitchers wanted to pitch at less. The only saving grace was that on that fateful night September 17th, it was cold and humid making the ballpark feel almost normal instead of a foreign planet where pitchers go to die. Let's kick it back to Nomo. He toes the rubber at the top of the second and promptly gives up a four-pitch walk to Andres Galarraga. He strikes out Vinny Castilla before Galarraga steals second, putting Nomo in trouble for the second straight inning. Steve Decker strikes out swinging and Naifi Perez pops up to get Nomo out of the inning, but he still didn't look his sharpest. In two innings, he had two walks, let runners in scoring position twice, gave up hard contact, and had already thrown 34 pitches. Pitch count, though, was hardly a concern for Nomo. He had grown up in the rigorous Japanese amateur system where pitchers were expected to finish their games no matter the pitch count, often multiple times a week. He'd also been coached by legendary Japanese pitcher Keishi Suzuki, whose solution for a sore arm was to pitch a complete game and whose motto was throw until you die. Before coming to the majors, Nomo had thrown 140 or more pitches in Japanese Pro Bowl 61 times, and in his first two seasons in the majors, he averaged nearly 7 innings per start. He had a reputation for a rubber arm, which would help him tonight against the Rockies, but it would also be the source of his quick and unfortunate decline. In the dugout, Hideo decides to make an adjustment. He walks to the mound and throws his warm-up pitches from the stretch. He wants to focus on the fundamentals on throwing strikes. Now pitching from the stretch, Nomo induces a hard grounder to second from pitcher Bill Swift to start the third, but Delino DeShields makes the play. Eric Young steps in for the second time, and for the second time hits one hard to center, but Wayne Kirby tracks it down. Quinton McCracken gets jammed on a fastball and grounds out. Nomo is settling in. In the fourth, Nomo issues a leadoff walk again before striking out Dante Bichette, his second of three strikeouts on the night. Andres Galarraga laces a grounder into the sixth hole. 
It seems like every no-hitter has a signature defensive play though, and tonight's comes from veteran shortstop Greg Gagne, who scrambles to his right, gloves the ball, and makes a clean throw to second. Next, Vinny Castilla steps in. He's hitting 412 against Nomo for his career. He works a 3-0 count and gets the green light, connecting with a fastball deep to right. Nomo turns around dejectedly, almost expecting it to land on the bleachers. Instead, it settles in Raul Mondesi's glove at the warning track. Nomo is out of the jam, and he's past the turning point. Nomo gets through the fifth in order, but in the sixth gives up another leadoff walk. He isn't worried, though. The Dodgers had built up a five-run lead, and it's unlikely he even registered that he hadn't given up a hit yet. He gives a reassuring nod to his infielders. He takes a deep breath. Lightning quick, a pickoff move to first, and Eric Young, taking off at first movement, doesn't stand a chance. Nobody else would step foot on base for the rest of the game. He ends the frame by snacking a comebacker and tossing to first. Nomo, one of the best strikeout pitchers in baseball, had only one strikeout in his last seven batters face, but he was still getting the job done. In the bottom of the seventh, Nomo retires Colorado in order with Raul Mondesi's third nice catch of the game. Two innings remain. In the top of the eighth, with runners on the corners and the Dodgers up five, Hideo Nomo steps to the plate. Nomo wasn't much of a hitter, but he wasn't expected to be since pitchers don't hit in Japan specific league. Because, well, it was just that kind of day, Nomo shoots a grounder into the hole for an RBI single. He stands on first awkwardly, but I mean, come on, give the guy a break. He's got a career 125 on base percentage, and he's already thrown 89 pitches today. In the bottom of the eighth, rookie Terry Jones and journeyman John Vanderwall pinch hit for Colorado, but to no avail. Nomo retires them both for a 1-2-3 inning. Three more outs to go. As the Dodgers score three more in the top of the ninth, all the players ignore Nomo, as is tradition for a pitcher in the middle of a no-hitter. He tries to rest, but mills around the dugout as the Dodgers send eight men to the plate, including Nomo, who ends the inning with a strikeout. In the bottom of the ninth, with the game all but decided, Hideo Nomo jogs to the mound. The once sellout crowd has been thinned by the rain delay, but everyone that had stayed until the fifth was still in the stands. They wanted to see something special. Hideo Nomo isn't nervous, he doesn't really even seem excited. Later, he would go on to say he was just happy to win the game for the pennant race. It was hard to shake Nomo, who just a year before carried the weight of international relations between two frosty countries. Japan and the US were in the midst of an economic battle in the 80s and 90s, with both nations developing quickly technologically, but Americans thought Japan was using unethical trade practices to get ahead. In the early 90s, instances of racism against the Japanese were the highest since right after World War II, and Japanese-made products were a common target for politicians. A Japanese scholar compared Nomo's cultural impact in the US to Babe Ruth visiting Japan in the 30s, and said Nomo is better than a hundred Japanese ambassadors to Washington. Nomo mania, as it was dubbed, was a turning point in the relationship between the two countries, and opened the door for other stars like Ichiro to make the jump from Japan to MLB. It was a heavy weight to bear, but by September 17, 1996, Nomo was past the worst of it. He didn't have much more to prove in America, but if anyone still had doubts, they'd be quelled in about 10 minutes. He faced the top of the Rockies' order to close it out in the ninth. Eric Young grounds out to second. Everyone in the stands, both Rockies and Dodgers fans, cheer. They want to witness history. Quinton McCracken swings at the first pitch and grounds out to second. The camera crew does the classic pan to a random Asian fan. There's one out to go. Vin Scully, the greatest sportscaster to ever live, lets the Japanese broadcast call the first pitch to Ellis Burks. Strike one. He works it to two and one, then fouls off a fork ball. One strike to go. I'll let Vin take it from here. Got him! Hideo Nomo has done what they said could not be done. Not in the Mile High City, not at Coors Field in Denver, he has not only shut out the Rockies, he has pitched a no-hitter, and thank goodness they saw it in Japan. It wasn't the most dominant no-hitter. Nomo had only eight strikeouts and gave up four walks with a lot of hard contact, so in that sense maybe it wasn't the greatest game ever pitched. But let's look at the bigger picture here. At the height of the steroid era, against a lineup with a 354 average at home, in the most unfriendly pitcher's environment in the history of Major League Baseball, in the middle of a tight pennant race, Hideo Nomo had done the impossible. Nobody has done it since, and I wouldn't be surprised if nobody does it again. Thanks for sticking around. I worked hard on this video, and I'd really appreciate it if you could sub to the channel and share it with anyone you think might enjoy it. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.